hours. I know that minute goes by <clears throat> quickly when you're writing. It could only go by so quickly when you're doing data. <laughs> Please pass those on to Diane. Now, before we get on to our second speaker, I want to tell you just a little bit about two more attractions in the Ripley's Empire. One is the Ripley Aquariums, which are very similar to the aquarium we have here in Denver. I think it's called Ocean Journey. I have that right? It used to be called the Ocean. Downtown Aquarium. Now, I think. The Downtown Aquarium. Well, they have they have three of those. One in uh, Aquarium of the Smokies is in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Then Ripley's Aquarium, which is in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And the Aquarium of Canada is in Toronto, Canada. Those are three of Ripley's aquariums. Also, they have the Guinness Museums. There are a number of those all over the world. And they have all the facts inside, and uh, you can uh, see the you know largest ball of twine and all the crazy stuff that's in the Ripley's museums and the Ripley oh, I'm sorry the Guinness museums and they have a franchise so if anyone is interested in bringing a Guinness museum to Denver there are probably franchise opportunities here in Denver the initial investment depending upon land development the initial investment for a Guinness Museum franchise is between six and twelve million dollars. So that's something you might want to think about. <laughs> Someone interested in that? Yes. What, what's the return? You need uh, uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not dot com, and they will tell you what the return is. The return is the joy of owning a Guinness Museum. That's self-satisfaction. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, our second speaker of the day. The famous UCLA coach, John Wooden, once said <coughs> that you can learn a page from a victory, but you'll learn a book from defeat. If that is true, then Steve believes his life's library would rival anyone's. <laughs> He's going to share with you a story of an unprecedented and destructive fall from grace that took away everything he treasured in life and tested his very will to live. And in the process of survival, a great journey of redemption and self-discovery. It's a true story, not easily shared by Steve. I'm sorry. True story, not easily shared. But Steve believes that it's a story worth sharing for others that have, are, or someday will face overwhelming obstacles and challenges in their own lives. Please help me welcome Steve Doherty and his speech, The Long Road Back. <laughs> Has anyone ever asked you a question that was so powerful and so profound that it changed your life forever? Of course you have. We all have. The examples might include... Would you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> or it might be... Sir, get out of the park. Put your hands behind your back. Right now. <laughs> or the always dangerous... Honey, these pants make me look fat. <laughs> We've all been there. My moment came... Ten years ago, immediately after my divorce, when my then ex-wife asked me this question. She goes, do you know what your most important role in life is now? Your number one job. Your number one job is to make certain that your children do not grow up to be like you. Now those of you who know me, those of you who know how seriously I take being a father, might chalk that up to a bitter ex-wife saying things. The fact of the matter is, she was 100% sincere and she was 100% accurate. 
And there's nothing more devastating than realizing you suck as a role model for your own children. Because fellow Toastmasters, for 25 years, I had built a public perception that was built entirely on facade and sleight of hand. I projected an image of someone playing a role, <coughs> pretending to be someone I wasn't. Because my reality was a nightmare. My reality was a long list of absolutely horrible decisions and judgments, alcohol, more bad habits and drug addictions than I care to list here, and a moral compass that had long ceased to be of any use to me. And in the middle of all this, God saw fit to put the most wonderful girl in my lifetime into my life. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. She was beautiful to look at. She was wonderful to, to be with. And when we got married, I thought it was the beginning of a dream. The reality was, it was the beginning of a 10-year nightmare for her. Because even with this angel at my side, even with the birth of my two wonderful children, even with the knowledge that I had a great life ahead of me and that I had kept everything secret from her, I had lit a fuse long before I met her that was destined to explode at some time. And one of the great ironies and tragedies of my life is the book I wrote about being a great father. What I had done is provide for my children the perfect father that existed only on paper. And they would get to meet him only if I died, which didn't seem like that remote a possibility at the time. So sadly, I didn't write the book in time to read it. The clock ran out on me. My life imploded. And over the next 90 days, nearly 10 years ago, I lost my house. I lost my wife and kids. I lost my business. I had a heart attack at the age of 46. I went through personal bankruptcy until I found myself waking up one morning in a dark and damp basement, all I could afford to rent, with a few clothes on my computer going, how in the hell am I going to get out of this? My long journey through hell culminated when I left the neighborhood. My wife and kids were, my four and six year old son and daughter were in the driveway, holding hands, crying, watching their father drive out of their life, possibly forever. And all I could do was shake my head and keep asking myself over and over and over, what now? What now? Let me tell you something. All options were on the table, and I mean all options. I would go so far as to say that it was at that moment that I discovered something invaluable. The first thing was that a phrase that I'd read years earlier popped into my head one morning that said, God does not take you into deep water to drown you, but rather to cleanse you. And at that moment, I discovered something that changed my life. I discovered that I could change my past. I could change my past. Now, I know there are probably people in here that still don't believe that time travel is possible. <laughs> You'll thank me. You all hear it when a catastrophe happens. Don't look back. You can't change the past. Don't try. Move along. What's done is done. It's over. The way you change your past is really quite simple, but it's not easy. You have to get up and you have to seize today and live it in an exemplary, honest, to the best of your ability, responsible fashion, and with great care and love for the world around you. And when tomorrow becomes today, you need to do it again. And pretty soon the days turn into weeks, and the weeks turn into months, and the months turn into years. And all of a sudden you have a decade of righteous and honorable living in your rearview mirror. And that decade is now your new past because you succeeded in changing your entire life. 
Today, the two things that I'm most proud of, number one, my ex-wife thinks I'm an extraordinary role model. <laughs> and number two, I've taken that father that existed only on the pages of a book that I wrote, and I've brought him to life in the eyes of my children. That's a miracle for which I'll forever be amazed at and be thankful for. For most of us, life happens when you least expect it. The important thing to remember is never to ask why. The important thing to ask is, what now? What now? Chances are the answer will surprise you, and in the process, you'll surprise yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Time will please put a minute on the clock. And you know the drill, which is why I don't know to Steve. <laughs>